I did um, a friend of ours that we had sent a card to a couple weeks ago, Larry Stern. He just wanted me to thank everybody and, and sent a heartfelt thank you because it was he just thought that was so nice that we sent him a card. So. I remember family of uh, Troy Dixon, Tony Flyer, and Troy's teammate, which is really famous for that money, he's passed away now. But then Terry Holdsworth passed away now. So you have to do some kind of time. And I stopped at and asked to remember his brother, David, so he can. Uh, Yeah. 
anybody else? They do. Oh, they do. So that's their different to us. Unless you've got one or two. Because we get home yesterday, we didn't know we got home, but hopefully it was okay. There was trouble with the start too. Anybody else? Okay. If not, we'll go to our next hand, which is in 330. <laughs>
us be able to receive the helpers. I mean, we uh, pray for our friends that many of them might even be here, uh, whether it's sickness or travel or just tired. I mean, we get all that. Pray that uh, you help them to know that you're with them and you're with them about them. And as uh, as your stage is getting a little bit more in your son, Lord, we give it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. It is fantastic to have everybody here. As I, as I told you, we're going to be starting a brand new series today. And if you want to get a book that has some of the source material that I've been working out of, it's this right here. This would be a great one for you to get. It's called The, uh, the Power of God's Names. And it's by a, a pastor, uh, Tony Evans. He's a pastor in Texas. Uh, he's a, I love listening to him on, on, on YouTube, and, and uh, he just has a, a really uh, a neat take on things. But that's one of the places I'm going to be working out of, and it's a fantastic book. And if you want to get something to, to supplement what we're talking about, that would be the thing, that would be the thing to get. But I want to start this morning. I, 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 want to, I want to set this up like this. 
I have learned uh, through sometimes um, joy and sometimes disappointment that my kids run to a specific parent for certain things. Like they've learned that if they think dad's going to say no, they don't come to dad. They go straight to mom. And they've learned that if they think that mom's going to say no, that if they've had you know, a rough day at the house and they've been butting heads a little bit, when I show up, they, hold their, they don't go ask mom stuff. They wait, oh, it's, dad's going to be home in an hour. Let's just hold on a little bit. And when dad gets home, hey, dad, can I borrow the car? Hey, dad, because I don't know what's been going on all day. Right? And so we're not going to add. Right? I've learned in uh, uh, being a, a parent uh, for 16 years, um, that when my kids hurt themselves or when they get hurt, they don't come to dad. They go straight to mom. Because what does mom do? She bends over and she picks them up and she comforts them. Right? She gives them a pat on the back. She'll carry them to the bathroom. She'll get them all cleaned up. She'll put them on the couch and get them something to eat. Not dad. Like they've learned. If they get hurt, I'm going to make a quick assessment. Hmm. I don't think any bones are broken. Get up. Right? They've learned. They've learned. But sometimes, even though I know that my kids want mom, I need to be the one to take care of them. When uh, Haley was little, we were first riding bikes. We uh, were down um, by the river road, and we were going up hills and down hills, and we got to this one place, and I was trying to get Caleb Come with me. No, let's go down this hill. We're going to go super fast. It's going to be awesome. Mm -mm. Not going to do it. Haley goes, I will. All right, then. Let's go. And so we take off down this hill. And as we're going down, I see this little bitty hole. And I'm like, surely. No problem. She'll see it. She'll miss it. No. Like a magnet. Straight to the thing. She hits the hole, flies over her handlebars face first into the asphalt, right? and I hear, you know, I, 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 and, 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 and while she's in air, I'm imagining Caleb going, that's what I knew was going to happen, right? But when she landed, I wouldn't even let Kim look at her, right? There was blood on her face and the whole thing. I'm like, no, 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 you just go get the car. I'll carry her up to it. You just, that was a, that required dad. That did not require mom. I didn't want to have to carry Haley and mom out of the thing. I've also learned that when the kids are scared, though, they run to dad. Gwen and Willow, in the, in the middle of the night, when, when, when things are, are going on, they hear a noise. Dad, I'm scared. Dad. And maybe that they've seen Kim do that. They've seen when stuff happens, Chris. Go check that out. Go see what that is. Right. So maybe that's where they've learned it from. But when they're scared, we'll say, what are you scared of, sweetie? Scary monsters. What scary monsters? The ones. I can't you hear them? No, there's no scary monsters in our house. Are you sure? I'm sure. All the scary monsters are scared of me. I'm meaner than all of them. Sometimes that works. Sometimes it doesn't. And I don't know why they come with me or come to me. Kim is, you know, you, you threaten her babies way scarier than, than I am. But I've learned that over, over being a, a, a dad for, for, for uh, uh, you know, 16 years now. And as I was thinking about what I wanted to share, you know, in regards to this, we're, gonna, we're talking about the names of gods. Where I wanted to start was is sometimes... The God that shows up, it's not the God that we want. We want a certain aspect of God. But what God knows that we need is something different than what we want. I've told you guys that one of my favorite stories in the Bible, it's the, it's the story of Haggai. It's a little two-chapter book. But the story of Haggai is that... that God's people were in captivity, and then Nebuchadnezzar, uh, uh, he put them into captivity, and then uh, there was a series of, of kings after him, and finally God's people were released to go back to Israel. 
and God's people, they came back, and you can read this in, 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 this, this in the, the, the book of Ezra. God's people came back, and they were charged. You go back, you, you rebuild the temple, you rebuild Jerusalem. And God's people came back, and, and they laid the foundation for the temple. And then they built the altar for the temple. And then some stuff happened, and they got sidetracked, and they stopped. What they did, they did what, what, what so many of us do. They built the parts of God's temple back that they viewed as, as that they needed. The altar was where they were able to make sacrifices for their sins. Like, like, like I was saying, they did what, what we tend to do. They wanted God for his forgiveness, but they didn't want it to cost them anything. They didn't want to put forth their own resources to rebuild the throne. I want God to forgive me. But this Lord of my life stuff, uh, I'm not sure I want that. Are you? Isn't that what we struggle with? I want God to forgive my sins, but I'm not sure I want to let him change what's going on. I want to, I want to do what I want to do. The God that we want isn't always the God that we get. Maybe a, a, another way to put it, you know, because, you know, um, not just, you know, with, with Kim and I, I have different roles. Just like you have different roles. And on all of my social media uh, uh, things, it, it, it goes something... Uh, uh, for uh, the, the bio, it, it, it goes, the biography it goes something like this. Husband, father, follower of Jesus, coach, small business owner, trying to make the world a better place. Right? Those are the different hats that I wear. And you have different hats. And in some regards, those hats overlap. And in some ways, those are very different things. It's, it's been fun to be able to, to coach all, a lot of my kids' sports. It's the first time that I'm not doing it. Uh, Willow's playing soccer, and I've never coached gymnastics. Wouldn't that be funny? Or, you know. um, but, uh, you know, when we were playing baseball, it was the most adorable thing ever that Gwenny would run up to me and she would call me on, on, just on the baseball field, hey, coach. That was, it was, it was cute, right? I loved that. But they don't want coach dad at home, right? Clean your room. Come on, faster, 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 faster. Let's go. Let's get this done. Come on. They don't want that at home. That's a different role. And in some ways, we, we have to keep those distinct. My wife doesn't want coach dad at home, right? I don't even want to put any, uh, I don't even want to give any uh, examples of what that might look like. And the car lots that I do work at, they don't want dad, Chris, to show up. Coming in and going, yeah, we need to do better over here, and we need to fix this, right? And, and somebody needs to clean that up. I, I wouldn't work at those car lots very often if, if dad showed up, right? Right? No, no, no. This isn't how we're going to spend money. <laughs> this is what, right? That, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't go over very well. The God that we want, it's not always the God that, 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 that shows up. And it's, it's not that God's different. There's just sometimes we need a different aspect of God. That's why when you read through, through your Bible, and we're going to look at a bunch of the different names of God, frequently God's given a different name in Scripture, not because of something that he did or said, because, but that's, the, that's, that's how God revealed himself to a person. He revealed himself as a provider. He revealed himself as, uh, 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 as, uh, as the Lord. He revealed himself as the creator. And that was his experience with the person and, and so that's how he got a, 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 u, a unique name in Scripture. But maybe even another way to describe this, the God that we want isn't the God that we need or the, the God that, that shows up. Think about how we pray. What, what's, what's for, for, and maybe you're not like me, but for me it gets pretty rote sometimes, pretty repetitive. 
starts out, you know, it, it, we, we, with the little ones, we pray almost every night together. Sometimes the older two will join us and sometimes they won't. But for me, uh, it's funny, uh, um, sometimes they'll mock my prayers and not like, ha, 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 ha. They'll just be like, we know what dad's going to say. And it's something to the effect of, you know, we, we pray that we, you know, we have a great day tomorrow. We pray that we wake up happy. We pray that we sleep good. I pray that we, uh, that you heal us um, of both our injuries and our illnesses. And just, it just gets kind of, and, and that we wake up refreshed and that we, we uh, are able to be kind to people. And we pray that, that you uh, help when there's an opportunity that you give us the courage to tell somebody about you. It's pretty, pretty standard. I used to pray uh, with Caleb and Haley when they were little. I think I've, I've, we've talked about this before, that, that, that my prayer was, God, we want you to give us, see if I can get this right, strong minds, thick skin, and a soft heart. Like that's how I wanted us to be able to engage the world. Right? Help us to be smart, to be able to you know, see what's going on, to learn everything that we're supposed to learn. But help us to have thick skin because kids can be mean, because you know, it's, it's a difficult world to live in. But then also help us to have soft hearts. Because even though sometimes people are mean, we want to treat people the way that Jesus treated us. And so you keep our hearts soft so that when we, you know, our thick skin's going on, we can still respond in kindness. But I don't know if you noticed that everything I prayed, give me, give me, give me, give us, give us, give us. For me, that's what tends to dominate my prayers. God, provide for me. God, give me, give me, give me. And there's a sense that we need that. That's one of the names of God is the provider, the God who provides. Also, you know, sometimes it's, it's God give me. Sometimes it's God protect me. Right? When our friends are traveling, sometimes we'll pray for traveling mercies or protect them on their, their journey. But, you know, God, do something for me. But there's, there is a God, the protector. That's, that's one of his names. And sometimes we'll be so, uh, we will be self-aware enough to go, God, forgive me. But again, it's, God, I need something from you. And that's good, and we should pray like that. Jesus taught us, God, to pray. Lord, we do it every Sunday. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us what we need. But Jesus didn't stop there. The God that we want, and the God that we, 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 the God that we want. It's not always the God who shows up. And so what I want to talk about this morning for the rest of this maybe introductory series, next week we'll get, start getting into some of the actual names of God. I want to talk about some different ways that this shows up in our lives. The God that we want isn't necessarily the God that we, the God that we need. And the first way that I think that it shows up, just like the people of, 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 uh, in Ezra and Haggai's time, is that we want a God that forgives us, but doesn't cost us anything. Right? We want God, forgive us, forgive us, forgiveness. How about you? Nah, no, 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 that's not, that's not what we want. Right? And in part, and we'll talk about this more in a second, it's built into our, 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 our the Baptist theology. Right? We, we have this, this, this phrase, that once saved, we're always saved. It's almost like a gotcha. You know, God, I, I'm in. Ha <laughs> ha! Right? You, it doesn't matter what I do now. And we know it's not. That's at its worst. But there's, there's a sense that, that that's what we, what we believe. God, we want a God who forgives us, but doesn't cost us anything. There's this story in 1 Chronicles 21. And, and I'm just going to read a small portion of it in a second. You don't have to flip over there. But what's going on is that David does something, King David does something that God specifically told him not to do. God said, I don't want you to ever run a census of your army. I don't want you to count your troops. And the reason is, is because I want you to depend on me and not in the strength of the armies that you have. And, 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 and this is one of those weird things in Scripture. In the book of 1 Kings, it says that God tempted David to do it, 
which seems odd, to tempt him to do something that he had already told him not to do. In the book of 1 Chronicles, it says that Satan tempted him, tempted him to do it. And this, this, this kind of, that's odd. So anyway, David falls for the temptation. He does this thing. He, 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 he runs a census on his, on his army. He finds out how many fighting men he has, how, many, how much cavalry he has, the, the, the whole nine yards. And God comes to him and he says, this is, we, we talked about this, David. I asked, I told you, I never want you to run a census. And so now something's going to happen. And he goes, he, he allows David to, to, to choose. Here, I'll just, I'll just read it. He says, uh, this is what the Lord says. Take your choice. Three years of famine, three months of being swept away by your enemies with their swords overtaking you, or three days of the sword of the Lord, days of a plague in your land. And God says, because you didn't listen, this is what's going to happen. And so David picks the plague. And so that begins to happen, and, and, and God releases a plague on Israel. And it says in, in, in later in the chapter that the angel of the Lord saw the outpouring of God, not a good outpouring, but the plague outpouring, and the angel of the Lord, Jesus, goes, this is too much. And he stops it, and then David, and he approaches David, and then he has, he, 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 he says that, that, that David said to him, or excuse me, uh, he stops it, and then God, he, he sends one of his prophets to him, and David's talking to this guy, and it says David said to him, look, let me have the side of your threshing floor so I can build an altar to the Lord, that the plague on the people may be stopped. Sell it to me at full price. And this guy replies to David, take it, let the Lord let my Lord, the King, do whatever he pleases. Look, I will give him the oxen for the burnt offerings, the threshing sledges for the wood and the wheat for the grain offerings. I'll, I will give all of this. And so, so, so the guy sees that David's in a mess. David knows that it's his decision that's caused problems for his whole country, that people are suffering because of what he did. And so David goes to this guy and he goes, look, the angel of the Lord, he told me to build an altar and so I need this land that we're on. And, and the, the guy, take it, take it, because that's what I want to be in favor with the king. You know, it's, it's yours. And he goes, not only that, I'll give you the oxen for the offering. It says, but King David replied, no, I insist on paying full price. I will not take for the Lord what's yours or sacrifice a burnt offering that costs me nothing. So David paid this guy the 600 shekels, shekels of gold for the site. David built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. He called on the Lord and the Lord answered him with fire from heaven on the altar for the burnt offering. David understood this. And you guys, you guys know how I feel about David. There were some remarkable, brave things that, that David did. There were some horrible things that Dave did. David did. Dave, we're not on a we're we're not close like that. I can tell you that. But there were some horrible things that he did. But David understood. If I'm going to give to God, if I'm going to expect something from God, it should probably cost me something. But that's not the God that we want. We want the God that I forgive you. I forgive you. Now, how about? You? Hmm, I don't know, God. That seems like too much. It seems like you're asking a lot. But I'll still take that forgiveness. I'll still take that right relationship with you. We want a God who forgives, but not one who costs me something. We want a God who protects us, but doesn't want to change us. The God that we want isn't necessarily the God that we need, right? We want a God that protects us, that when we go out and, and we follow, right, we do so often what the scripture talks about. It, 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 we, we, want to, we, right, we see what God wants for us and we want to turn to the right or to the left. We want to do what we want to do. We want to be wise in our own eyes. We want to make choices that we think are right without talking to God 
but then we want him to protect us when we don't get the outcome that we want. We want a God who protects us, but doesn't want to change us. That's what I was talking about earlier, right? At, at our, 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 if you take our, you know, the, 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 the once saved, always saved theology to the most negative version of it, it's, I, I, I got him. I'm in this deal with God. Nothing he can do about it now because I'm in, right? I'm saved, so let's go party. Right? You could look at it that way. But to its best, it's I'm so grateful that he decided to, to do something for me, to save me, that I now get to be in a right relationship with him. I'm obviously going to leave that stuff in the past. And this is, it's not new to us. The Apostle Paul talks about this dilemma that we have. He talks about it in the book of Romans. What was it, it, in Romans 6? It says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that God's grace can increase? Says, look, whenever we sin and God forgives us, it, just look how awesome it makes God look. Right? So if I want to show how gracious God is to everybody, I should sin more. I should so. Show everybody the depths of how great God is because I can go out, what I was saying earlier, do whatever I want, and God's going to forgive me. Here's how Paul says that we should respond to that line of thinking. He says, by no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too get to new, live a new life. He says, that's, that's, he goes, just whenever you were being obedient and you were taking into the waters of baptism, it's, 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 it's what that is, it's, a, it's symbolic of what Jesus did for us going into the ground for three days and being raised to a new life. We're going, just as Jesus died and then came back by resurrection power, when we do this thing, when we're baptized, and then we go, I'm, 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 I'm killing the sin that's in my life. And none of us can do that perfectly, but we, that's, that's going to be our attitude. I'm going to allow God to change me. And so I'm going to go under, and that's me saying I'm going to kill the sin that's in my life. And I'm going to be raised to a new life, a life that Jesus is now in charge. But that's not the God that we want. We want a God that protects us, but doesn't necessarily change us. We want a God who will forgive us, but it doesn't cost us anything. We want a God that protects us, but he doesn't change us. We want a God that provides for us, but doesn't consume us. We want to give me, give me, give me, give me, God bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me. We want God to give us stuff out here, but what God wants to do is he wants to give us stuff in here. No, 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 no. No. I want my stuff. I don't want a new heart. I want a new car. I don't want to have to be generous. We want a God that provides for us, but doesn't consume us. We want the stuff, and He wants to give us Himself. In fact, you know, in, in, in Matthew 23, this is what Jesus said. He goes, Woe to you, teachers of law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the dish, but inside you're full of greed and self-indulgence. That's what he's saying. He goes, look, on the outside, you make yourself look very pretty. But on the inside, there's some stuff going on that's not so pretty. And if we're really honest, it's just not, not, the different, not any different for us. 
And what Jesus is saying, well, let's go ahead and finish reading. He goes, you blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and the outside will be clean as well. See, we want a God to provide for us, but not consume us. We want God to give us stuff on the outside, and he goes, I want to clean up yourself. I want to clean you up from the inside. He goes, and once we clean you up on the inside, what's going to come out of you? It might not have been the things that you thought that you wanted in the beginning, but it's going to be better. It's going to be better. You think you know what you want. And I think I know what I want. And God goes, what you need is for me to, my presence to be in your heart. See, later, Jesus' friend, the Apostle Paul, he would, he would say, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, this is Romans 12, 1 and 2, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Don't conform to the patterns of this world. Right? That's, 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 that's what we want to do. We want to look out and we go, that looks fun, or I wish I had that, or that's how you get ahead. Got it. And Paul goes, mm -mm. no. Don't conform to those patterns of the world. But, be transformed, not out here, in here, by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. See, we want a God that provides for us. And that's an aspect of God. He wants, he promises to give us what we need. But we don't necessarily want what God has to offer. He wants to change us from the inside out. We want stuff. He wants us to be generous. We want people to be kind to us. And he says, you go show compassion. We want a God that provides for us, but doesn't consume us. We want a God that protects us, but doesn't want, doesn't try to change us. We want a God who forgives us, but doesn't cost me anything. And so that's what this series is going to be about. It's going to be about allowing God to be who he is in our lives. And that doesn't mean that there's a bunch of different gods running around. Which one do we worship? It's about letting God show up in the form that he needs to, trusting him to give us what he knows that we need in the moment. It's about letting mom show up when it's time for compassion. It's about letting dad show up when there's scary noises. It's about letting God show up in the, in, the, in the right role. Because frequently, the God that we think that we need, the God that we think that we want, not the God that we need. And so that's what, again, that's what this series is about. It's about us learning who God is in his fullness, trusting him to show up as he sees fit. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, help us to, to take a, a brand new look at you, to realize you're more than just what we want you to be. And so God, when we need discipline, Give us the courage to allow you to be a parent. God, when we need provision, God, give us the wisdom to allow you to, out, to bring people into our lives. God, when we, when, when we need a Lord because we're making bad choices, God, help us again to have the wisdom to allow you to dictate our lives. And God, when we need forgiveness, as we always do. God, help us to have the humility to allow you to be the same. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's take communion. You're going to sing song first? You tell me. Okay. That's okay.
One of the ways that God shows up for us was in his son. And what God had initially set up was a system to where we made sacrifices for our sins. And what God, what was, what the Apostle Paul would say, it was supposed to bring life to us. What people actually realized was that we can never live up to God's expectations. So periodically, we do this thing called communion as a reminder to us that we can never live up to God's expectations, but that God sent his son to make up any difference that we have there. And so on the night before, the night that he was betrayed, here's what it says in Matthew 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. And then he took a cup. And when he'd given thanks, he said to them, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from the fruit of this vine from now until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And then they sung a hymn, and then Jesus went out to be betrayed. And so Jesus, he, he, he showed up in a human form, Emmanuel, God with us, and he showed up as the Lamb of God, offering himself for all of our sins because we could never live up to God's expectations. And he says, look, what's going to happen is I'm going to allow my body to be broken for you. And then what's going to happen is I'm going to allow my blood, no more sheep and goats and duh, I'm going to allow my blood to be shed for you. And what this is going to do is it's going to bring in a new covenant, not one that you have to earn your salvation, but one that it is freely given. And what I hope that that does, not here, but in other places he talks about it, is that it builds a gratitude into our lives so that we don't, so that we allow him to cover us so that we don't feel shame or guilt anymore. He says, this is what the new covenant's about. And so I'm going to pray, and we're going to take a moment, we're going to pass the, the bread, and we're going to pass the juice. And this is about new covenant. It's a reminder that we don't earn our salvation. But we allow God, we allow Jesus to show up as to who he is. And we accept the gift that he has for us. And in hopes that we allow that to make us, to build gratitude into our lives. Let's pray. Your Heavenly Father, God. God, we're so grateful. God, help us to take a moment to focus on Jesus and what he did for us. He didn't have to, and he chose to. He showed up in a way that we needed him and we didn't even know that we needed him. God, he says that his, this new covenant, this thing that he does for us, covers all of our sins. God, help us to receive that today. That we don't have to feel the guilt or the shame anymore. And help that, God, to motivate us to live a new life in him. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.
et Enjoying. Dear Heavenly Father, one last time we come before you this morning and we're just so grateful for the sacrifice that your son made. God, help us to live lives that are worthy of the calling that are in proportion to the sacrifice that he made. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us be.